Now, there's one other aspect of this feud between the papacy and Saddam Hussein that I want to take time now to address. Many of you have never been told this, never recognized this, but Iraq is the site of the ancient Tower of Babel and Nimrod and Nebuchadnezzar, figures in the Bible, Antichrist figures in the Bible. Nimrod led all the people whom God had said spread out and fill the earth and pop and populate the earth. They weren't supposed to stay in one place. This was immediately after the flood. Nimrod kept all the people in the plains and built walls around the city, not for protection, but so that Saddam, that, that the ancient Saddam Hussein, rather, Nimrod could keep control of the people, and he led them all to rebel against God immediately after the flood. Once again, to force the people in rebellion against God to worship the sun and the moon and the stars, the creation. They worship the creation more than the creator. And so they angered God. Nimrod angered God. We all know what happened. God confounded the languages. The people couldn't communicate. And they, they couldn't finish the, the tower from which to worship the sun and the moon and the stars. And so because their languages were confused, by default, God created the nations because everyone of like tongue gathered together segregated themselves according to language. That's how God created the nations. And since they could no longer cooperate, all of these nations, because they spoke languages unfamiliar to themselves, they did as God originally intended. They sought various places throughout the world to stay together and to form their own nations. That's how we get the nations today. The Bible describes the nations. They are derived all from one single location, the ancient city of Babylon. Okay, The gospel had never come to them. They wouldn't receive the gospel. They didn't worship the creator. They were heathens and pagans outside the commonwealth of God. Now, Saddam Hussein attested himself to be the modern incarnation of Nimrod. And he even sought to rebuild that ancient city of Babylon. Now, I'm sure you've maybe never heard this before, but the papacy claims that it, and it alone, is the successor of Nimrod. Okay? And they worship the sun, the moon, the stars. Look at any Roman Catholic iconography. Look at the images in, in St. Peter's Basilica and other Catholic basilicas around the world. You'll see their veneration and worship of the sun. Even the monstrance in which they place the Eucharistic wafer is in a solar blaze. The solar blaze is, is unique to every pagan religion and nowhere more so than Roman Catholicism. And the papacy resented Saddam Hussein's claim to be the modern reincarnation of Nimrod. And so Saddam Hussein had to go. And the building of the ancient city of Babylon had to stop. Just this would this had happened previously in history as well. You remember the, the Japanese Empire was called the, the Empire of the Sun and that the Japanese Empire was 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 regarded as the sun god, the, the 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 Japanese emanation of the ancient solar deity, Nimrod. And there too the Vatican insisted that he was the emanation of the sun god and that no one else could claim that title and that it was an assault against his Babylonian throne. 
That's why the Bible calls this Roman Catholic Church mystery Babylon the Great. And so the papacy used the United States during the Second World War to destroy the kingship or the deified. The king of, of Japan was regarded by the people as divine and infallible. Those are the two characteristics claimed alone by the papacy. And so the great crusader for the Pope, the United States military, under false pretenses, never admitting any of this to its people, never admitting any of this to its military, conquered Japan and conquered that solar deity, the emperor of Japan, and destroyed the empire of the sun. That belongs to the Pope and the Pope alone. And if you have family members who died in the Second World War or who were injured and, and imprisoned and tortured during the Second World War by Japan, you can credit the papacy for that. Because they weren't fighting for the sovereignty of this nation. They were fighting to conquer all competition for the Pope. I'm sure many people that are listening have never heard this before. And I credit Eric John Phelps. Eric John Phelps is, has much to be faulted for, but he has much to be given credit for. And this is wonderful research on his part. The role of the United States, the papal role of the American crusading military to conquer the emperor of the sun in Japan and the emperor of the sun in Iraq. For the same reasons... The Vatican was behind George H.W. Bush's military assault using United States Protestants who valiantly fought for their country. You know, you can't speak a word against the, uh, the uh, uh, veterans of this country. You come under universal condemnation. Your life will be threatened if you say anything against the military people of this country. But just remember, they were never told why they went to war. And they boast about their military service, never accepting any word of criticism about what that war was all about. They were literally the battle axe of the Pope. In the Second World War and in this, this George H.W. Bush night of Malta led papal crusade against Saddam Hussein. We don't fight wars to maintain the sovereignty and independence of this country. We fight wars in order to become part of the papal kingdom. And we've earned our place. The United States, once called a Protestant nation, has earned its place of veneration with the papacy. The Pope's New World Order could never have advanced without the awesome power of the United States military. And I'm sorry if this offends American uh, military personnel. But how can I thank United States military veterans for providing that service for the papacy? How can I? I don't want to criminalize them. I just want them to wake up. I want all of America to wake up. You don't fight wars. You don't pay for wars. You don't bleed in wars to defend this nation. All of it. All of the bloodshed, all of the loss of, of, of treasure, of life, and of blood is to advance the papal crusade, this global Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. And the incalculable debt that the United States owes, the Vatican Bank, the Federal Reserve Bank, is ultimately owed to the very man of sin who we're promoting. And that's why the American people have no voice in, in what wars we fight and don't fight. That's why the American people don't even demand of our government to tell us precisely what the wars are about. They're clueless about what these wars are about. But if the American people ever wake up and ask the, the damning questions, 
then what hope does the Vatican have of concluding and com completing this futurist lie? I want to stop what the Pope plans on doing on Mount Moriah in Jerusalem, even though it's prophesied to be fulfilled. Because if somehow or other the Pope runs into a hitch in his get-along and can't f accurately fulfill that future phony fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, 27, then I have a better chance of convincing people that it was Jesus who fulfilled that 2,000 years ago. And that this Pope really is the man of sin, the son of perdition, just like I claim. This Pope and every Pope before him and every Pope after him is the man of sin, the son of perdition. It's an office, it's not a single individual. How could one man who lives within the span of 70 years deceive the whole world? How could one man in the span of 70 years of life, that predicted by God to be the lifespan of a normal human being, how could he deceive the whole world and lead the whole world to war against Christ? It's untenable, and yet that is what is preached and that is what is believed in the futurist churches of this country, both Roman Catholic and, I, I won't even call them Protestant. There's not a stitch of Protestantism in their blood. But it's believed. It's believed. This is just the most colossal deception one can imagine and it has deceived the very elect of God this whole book is designed to cover up while admitting that the Vatican has complete control of our foreign and domestic policy this book serves also to cover up the papacy's main objective in the world A phony fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And to rob from Christ any legitimate claim to be the Messiah. Because Daniel prophesied about the Messiah, and only the Messiah. It was the coming of the Messiah. In the beginning of the 70th and final week of that vision, Jesus would be baptized by the, by the uh, prophet John the Baptist. Beginning the 70th week, three and a half years later, he would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life on the cross, saying it is finished. And God would confirm that from the throne of glory when he ripped the veil of the temple from top to bottom, thus putting a permanent end to animal sacrifices. You either believe in Jesus or you don't have a sacrifice. So what's what's all this talk in the Protestant world about the Jews building a temple and beginning animal sacrifices again? For the purpose of eating and drinking damnation to themselves in confirmation that they still reject Jesus Christ as their lamb. What Protestant would encourage or even assist a Jew to build a temple made with hands in which God does not dwell? Why would a Bible-believing Christian profess to be a Christian and insist that the Jews have to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again? Do you think those animal sacrifices are going to be any more efficacious than the mass of the Eucharist of the Roman Catholic Church? That in itself is a denial that Jesus was the one-time, all-sufficient sacrifice for sin. And that's why Rome preaches that you have to confess your sins to a priest and not to Jesus. You've got to confess your sins to a priest. You have to maintain, uh, obtain absolution from the priest, who is the representative of the Pope. All that power that ultimately comes from the Pope. You see how you've transferred the worship of Jesus Christ to the Pope? Do you want the Jews to do the same thing? Because after all, it's not going to be until the Pope says it's okay for the Jews to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices again. So who is the ultimate authority in this? The man of sin, the Pope. Jesus is out of the picture. We're looking for a future Christ. A future Messiah. 
You see how the papacy is subtly robbing Jesus Christ of the very sacrifice that he made for you and me? And the United States is the one that's making it happen. Without the United States, the Vatican would be helpless to fulfill this phony future of 70th week of Daniel. You getting the idea that there's a whole lot of repenting to do in this country? You getting the idea that we are the enemies of Christ? In believing futurism? That we are instruments of Satan to cause the Jews to eat and drink damnation to themselves? We ought to be professing Jesus Christ to the Jews. Convincing them that he was their Messiah, that he fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. Repent and believe. But that's not the message of American Protestants. The message of American Protestants is we've got to have a temple for the Jews so they can make animal sacrifices again. Because God has found another way to redeem the Jews than Jesus Christ. Or that somehow eating and drinking damnation to themselves in false sacrifices, which God said were a stench in his nostrils, is somehow going to be an alternative way to save the Jews. Listen, your love for the Jews, as is my love for the Jews, justified, but not outside of Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God. If you preach any other truth, then Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and the Messiah of the whole world, even the nations, that were once outside of the commonwealth of Christ. You have deceived the Jews. You are guilty of their blood. Do you love the Jews? Then preach Jesus. If you hate the Jews, preach a temple and animal sacrifices. Am I making myself clear? Do you get it? If you're getting it, please write me, will you? I need to hear it from the people. If somehow I have inadequately described this to you, if you have any questions about this, please write me and ask me. At least write me and tell me I'm getting it. It's imperative. It's imperative for the salvation of the Jews, that they accept Jesus as their, as their sacrifice and repudiate a Jewish temple and repudiate false animal sacrifices that only confirm in this late day their continued rejection of the, of the Lamb that God provided for them. We're taught from cradle to grave to love the Jews. Do you love them? Do you want them to receive Christ? Then quit preaching a future temple and animal sacrifices. Quit supporting the Jews in their attempt to build a temple and begin animal sacrifices. Quit applauding the Jews for creating the, the golden candelabra and the table of showbread. And the, what, Ark of the Covenant? Where's the Ark of the Covenant? Is it on earth? Or is it in heaven? Remember, that whole temple was fashioned in the likeness of something that exists in heaven. And when Jesus fulfilled the role of Savior of the world in the shedding of his blood in the midst of the week, the 70th week of Daniel, all those earthly instruments became useless, just representative of something that truly exists in heaven. Now do you understand why it's useless for the Jews to build earthly instruments of animal sacrifices, a temple, an altar? I just never know if I'm getting through to people. I just have to take it in faith that if I preach the truth, God will bless it. And I ask his blessing. With all the fervency of my heart, I ask that God blesses the truth. 
and makes it believable in, God, in the hearts of God's people in this work in this world, despite all the lies from every quarter. Only he has the power to do that. I can't fashion words fancy enough to accomplish what only the Holy Spirit can do in a man's life. All I can do is lay out the truth as best as I can and pray God to give the increase. But you have to be willing to accept the truth when you hear it. The hideous truth. All right. I've exhausted myself. It says, the war started a few hours later on the morning of January 17, 1991 with a heavy air campaign. The first Iraq war lasted six weeks until February 27th when Saddam finally agreed to withdraw his forces from Kuwait. Though the Pope's plea to avoid war had been ignored, this is for public consumption, you have to know that George H.W. Bush would never have launched a military campaign against Kuwait or against Saddam Hussein if he didn't have the Pope's secret approval. Now you know the purpose why the Vatican wanted Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. Okay. Though the Pope's plea to avoid war had been ignored, the Vatican quickly moved to support U.S.-initiated post-war peace efforts. So now the Pope's on board. The war's over. We can't do anything about it now. Can't gather up the spilled milk. Can't gather up all the spilt blood. So now we're going to get about the business of establishing the peace. Remember the Jesuit oath? Okay. They always sit at the peace table. Establishing the peace, the terms of the peace. So instead of the Vatican continuing to, po to seemingly oppose the United States, now they're on board and want to have a hand in the peace efforts. You see what's happening? The Vatican paints itself as the peacemaker while he is the warrior of the world, the destroyer of the world. He says, to allay any suspicion of hard feelings, the Pope greeted President George H.W. Bush warmly when he visited the Vatican on November of 1991. Why? Because <laughs> George W. Bush was the most valuable weapon in the Pope's arsenal. The, the George H.W. Bush administration accomplished what the Pope wanted to do. He says, the Pope and President met alone for an hour. Boy, would, wouldn't you love to have been a mouse in the corner in that lonely hour between President George H.W. Bush and the man of sin and found out the truth about the Iraq War. He says, the Pope and the President met alone for an hour, even longer than Pope John Paul II's meetings with Reagan in 1982. Remember, it was Ronald Reagan that handed this country over to the papacy, lock, stock, and barrel, on a silver platter. John Paul II badgered and berated the United States for being a warmonger, of all things, materialistic, a nation that aborts its babies, drug-infested, morally bankrupt, and so satisfied with its wealth that it doesn't seek the, you know, the God of this world, the Pope. Roman Catholics aborting their babies against Roman Catholic canon law. It's all supported by the United States government. And Ronald Reagan was just whipped like a pup. And it is said that he just got on his knees before the Pope, kissed his ring and said, Father, I give you my country. Holy Father, no, no, no. Holy Father, I give you my country. As if he had the authority to do that. But look, he submitted to papal authority. In the belief that the Pope is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And that he has the right to rule this whole world without opposition. Holy Father, I give you my country. As if he didn't already have complete possession of it. 
and control of it. I hope my listeners are beginning to get a clue just how much this papacy controls not only the government of the United States but the kings of all the earth. There isn't another candidate in all the world for the man of sin, the son of perdition. It's got to be the Pope or there isn't such a thing. Strong medicine. Inquisition update. I'll see you tomorrow.